Yeah. Share my screen. Okay. Well, welcome all to the River Recover Fort Collins. So glad everyone can join us today. We looks like we have an interesting program coming up. Um, click through the agenda on the agenda today. We we do guest. We have an inspiration by Bob. Has some announcements. Bill's going to give us an update on the Burundi project, and he's also going to introduce our speaker today. And on our speaker today, I'm just some comments on programs. I mean, our programs are, are. I think our program committee does a great job. We've had a lot of great speakers this year. Programs are meant to be informative, interesting, and just to remind everyone that the views of the speakers are the views of the speaker, not the views of the club. I mean, this week we have a real interesting speaker talking, discussing um, his views on militarism. And then next week, we're gonna get a completely different view, I think, from Bill Kennedy, a retired um, US Air Force officer who's gonna, and also a military planner at the Pentagon, former military planner at the Pentagon, Pentagon who's gonna discuss his views on national defense spending. And so I hope you all can, will en enjoy all the programs, enjoy both programs. They should be interesting. And if you have any program ideas or submissions, please catch up with Dave or Stacy, and they will be glad to let you know how to submit a program idea. We're always looking for good and informative and entertaining programs for the club. Now, if we could take a moment and introduce our guest today. I know we have Wiley's on the call. If you could um, introduce yourself, Wiley, and anybody else, any other guests, if you could unmute yourself and introduce yourselves. Hi, John, I appreciate that. I uh, just moved here with my family. I retired from the Air Force the end of August uh, out of DC at the Pentagon. and. Uh, my, my wife and two college age sons uh, just moved to Fort Collins. This is our new home and uh, looking forward to meeting everybody and getting connected with the community. Do we have any other guests on the call? If not, I'd like to turn it over to Bob Maroney. He's gonna do our inspiration for today. Okay, um, I thought in the spirit of today's talk about militarism uh, that I would do a inspirational moment associated with that, sort of a historical one. And so our qu question is militarism, is war a racket? And uh, the first thing I would show you is this pre-World War II cartoon that's from the Winnipeg, Canada. And it shows war uh, being celebrated by a group of participants around its base that include a cannon maker, an armament trust, a powder maker, and the results of war are pestilence, ruin, famine, and militarism. And so this is a rather grim picture of uh, what happens during a war situation. Uh, I thought it was uh, showing how uh, war has two viewpoints. And another viewpoint is projected by General Smedley Darlington Baker. He lived from 1881 to 1940. He was a US Marine Corps Major General. He had the highest rank authorized at the time in the Marines. He was the most decorated Marine in US history up to that time. He had 16 medals at the time of his death, two Congressional Medals of Honor, five for heroism. He was a Marine Corps Brevet Medal, and he was known as Old Gimlet Eye and the Fighting Quaker. Uh, later, the USS Butler, a Gleaves class destroyer, was named in his honor in 1942. And it participated in the European and Pacific theaters of operation during the Second World War. She was later converted to a high-speed minesweeper. 
Now, old Gemlerai participated in military actions in the Philippines, China, Central America, Caribbean, and France. I think if you were to look at his enthusiasm and his activity, he was a combination of General Patton, General MacArthur, and General Eisenhower. He was quite an interesting fellow. But after the war and a 34-year career as a Marine, he had an epiphany about the evils of war. And he spent the rest of his life campaigning against US involvement in wars and wrote a book called War is a Racket. And his a statement taken from his book said, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service. And during that period, I spent most of my time as a high class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico and especially Tampico safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua with the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1902 to 12. I bought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was to operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. So I say, to hell with war. We can see through General Butler's eyes, militarism is its worst, and we hopefully can do better. So with those sort of grim thoughts, I encourage you to join me in pledging the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. So together we say, I pledge allegiance, allegiance. to, the, to flag the flag of the United, of the United, States, United States, States of America, of America. and, to, and the to the Republic, Republic for, for which, which it stands. stands. One nation, One nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Kathy Hawkins, if you could unmute yourself and we have an announcement on a district governor's grant. Okay. Hey, I think I'm, I'm talking. You have to be smarter than the computer. Um, we have been awarded a district grant um, for a project to provide underwear for um, our homeless population and underserved population. Um, when Right before the um, COVID epidemic started, I had um, been working with the Home Reliance Mobile Laundry. And one of the things I noticed was the clients had no underwear. And while it's not a necessity, it's certainly a thing for dignity. So um, I've been really thinking about this project for a while and I'm really excited. We got $1,000 from the district and we have $1,000 from the charity's budget that we can spend. I'm working with some local vendors and the project will probably really start in earnest after the first of the year. So looking forward to it and stay tuned. Thank you, Kathy. And one reminder on the holiday party, I dropped the um, link in, for, in the chat for the holiday party, please RSVP as soon as you can. And or, or contact Judy Boggs and she can let you know how to get signed up for the holiday party. We're hoping to have a good events coming up December 5th at the Fort Collins Country Club. They've got lots of interesting things planned. Also, also one note on the um, district grant, just a reminder that district grants, they are funded by your donation to the Rotary Foundation, as it is Foundation Month, officially in November, that we talk a lot about international grants and 
Bill Timpson is going to talk about one of our his international projects, and they are funded by Rotary Foundation donations. But we don't talk too often that remember that the district grants they're also all funded by your Rotary Foundation donations. And now I'd like to turn it over to Bill Timpson, who's going to give us an update on his project in Burundi. You want to go ahead and uh, share the slide? Oh, thanks, John. So I've presented some of this, oh, some time ago. This started almost 10 years ago. We submitted a proposal. And as you all know, Rotary has seven international centers for peace and conflict studies. In Burundi, as part of our phase three global grant, we are piloting some new peace studies that emphasize communication, cooperation, critical and creative thinking in the hopes that this will also help deal with the pandemic. So you can see Burundi right there. Uh, Rwanda is north and east. Uh, Uganda is north and north and east. Rwanda is north and west. Um, the Congo is directly to the west. Kenya is to the east. So it's a small country um, colonized by the first the Germans who ha then handed it over to the Belgians. And, and you all probably know they carved up Africa, exploited the resources. Back in the 1800s and earlier, they enslaved and sold Africans. Uh, and so Burundi was digging out of that legacy. And our guest today will um, speak to that because he's become a big friend of what we're doing there. Next slide, John. So we're in Gozi. If you see right above Burundi is the word N-G-O-Z-I. Because in the midst of a horrific civil war that broke out after independence, Gozi remained relatively peaceful. In Elise Boulding's book, Cultures of Peace, challenges us to go to places where peace has happened and study that, understand it, the complexities. A lot is written about wars and battles and heroes and the glamorization, if you will. Uh, we, the complexities of peace remain unstudied or much less studied. And so that's why we're in Gozi to try to understand that. Next slide, please. So 10 years ago, there's a group of young people that joined my class on peacemaking and they were inspired. Uh, they wanted to go out into the community and start bringing the message out there. Uh, and it was, it was exciting to see them pick up the mantle of service and eventually this evolved into participation in Rotary. Next one. So what's happened over 10 years is We've created a lot of P uh, case studies. We've taken a lot of students through different activities around the wall that surrounds this little university. It's only um, 22 years old. And the university was formed at the end of the Civil War when people up in Gozi said they wanted a different kind of a university because there had been some tragic murders at the University of Burundi. So they wanted their own. And this is a private, the first private university in, in Burundi. And over time, and with the, with the um, inspiration, if you will, from our global grants, they've put up these murals around the university celebrating their heroes from Gandhi to King and others. Next one. They also, the clubs have uh, gotten very excited about Rotary and the push to do service. So the fellow in the middle uh, helped organize the Rotary Club in Gozi to partner with a small village nearby that was poor and suffering from horrific water quality problems. They had open water that was used by animals, by uh, washing clothes for drinking water and surprise, surprise, they had all kinds of health problems, including dysentery. So this club got together and they built this um, water system covering up the open water. And now they have a, a place to wash clothes you can see there and another spout for drinking water made a huge difference 
and the club's been very excited. They've done a second one since then. So uh, I'm very proud of they've, they've picked up the mantle of Rotary and they're running with it uh, and doing great things. Next one. So we're trying to involve along with the community, we're trying to involve local colleges and universities. These are provosts and presidents of different campuses. And we're talking to them about a peace studies curriculum because Burundi is so close to the civil war, which only ended 20 years ago, that there are a lot of memories and a, it becomes a, a rich, if you will, repository for case studies of what not to do and what possibly to do. Next one. So I'm gonna use this to introduce our guest. They've taken seriously this last uh, global grant, uh, putting together curricula, reaching out to communities, challenging schools and universities to do more to teach peace, to connect with the world. International Day of Peace is something organized by the United Nations. So they're, so they're starting to connect with uh, outside forces, outside sources of information, of inspiration. Uh, but this is a very poor country, one of the five poorest on the planet, very few resources to do this. So curriculum became a challenge. How do we get resources to this, this startup effort? And that's where our guest came in. Uh, David Swanson uh, is the CEO of World Beyond War. It's a repository of resources. Uh, their website is very rich. And they have pulled together a number of online courses. So I heard about it and sent it to our folks in Burundi uh, and they're looking for help. And of course they're landlocked and they have no resource to get out or send people out to study. But the online classes became very exciting and a, and a huge possibility. So um, I got the response back that they had five students who would love to take the course, but they couldn't afford the tuition. So I turned to David Swanson at World Beyond War and I said, David, here's a, here's a peace effort program that we have to celebrate and uh, they'd love to take your course. This is, English is their third language, keep in mind. And so we have young people in that group who said, yes, I wanna take this. I wanna learn English and study and develop this the, the, a, a new skill set. So, uh, but I told David Swanson that they can't afford the tuition. And he said, well, pay what you can. I said, okay. So we put up a modest uh, amount and six people went through the program. They have certificates and uh, I'm so proud of them. There they are. And they hope to take this message of, of peace studies out into the world. It's moving forward with new communication skills new abilities to cooperate, understanding, critical thinking, creativity. And relative to what David Swanson will talk to us today, we also want to look back historically. What happened in Burundi that led to this horrific civil war? 10% of their population killed, 10% refugees, the environment um, obliter obliterated in, in some places. And interestingly, uh, could that war have been avoided is a question we want to talk about. Nelson Mandela came up to Burundi in 2000 and helped them uh, work, helped them develop and then sign a peace accord that was about power sharing, not one privileged group being in power and using their military to stay in power. That's what the Europeans had had. That was their legacy. The Germans came down and put the minority in power, the Tutsi. The Belgians inherited that. They used their military to support the minority, divide and conquer. They also brought in a racist, high, racist hierarchy. And this may sound familiar to what the colonists did around the world. So that the Tutsi, it was not the whites, it was the Tutsi who were superior to the majority Hutu. And that was the lessons that were that was taught in the schools and acted out. So the Tutsi got the privileged jobs, they got the best schooling, they got the advantages, they dominated the military, they dominated the 
our, the uh, police force and government offices. So Mandela came in and said, you have to change this structurally. You have to change this systematically. You must go to power sharing. And that's what broke through the peace process and why it's holding today. So now today, there is a healthy percentage of the military that, are, that include both tribes, Tutsi and Hutu, a healthy percentage of the police force that include both, and a healthy percentage of government offices that include both. So that was the agreement. We will integrate and share power. Interestingly, Mandela also pushed that women be integrated into the military, the police, and the government, and you have a much larger number of women now in important positions in all three. So instead of the Europeans leaving when, the, in, when independence was declared, uh, and the elite Tutsi uh, using their military to stay in power. Now we have a mixed group, Hutu, Tutsi, military police working together to move forward. So a, a big lesson. And I think uh, Dave Swanson would agree that war was unnecessary. And if somehow the world and Mandela could have intervened, perhaps it could have been avoided. So we're looking at those lessons too and how do we go forward? So with that, let me introduce Dave Swanson. He's an author, journalist, radio host, co-founder and executive director of worldbeyondwar.org, where this course uh, originated that we're using, and campaign coordinator for rootsaction.org. His books include War is a Lie. He blogs at davidswanson.org. He, he hosts uh, Talk Nation Radio. He's a Nobel Peace Prize nominee and was awarded the 2018 Peace Prize by the US Peace Memorial Foundation. And you can follow him on Twitter and Facebook. And that was in our newsletter that we, that we sent out. So let me um, introduce someone who's become a great friend of our work in, in Burundi. Uh, the students are excited about the opportunity he's opened up to them. They're connecting to the world. And uh, I think he's, uh, David's got a big message for all of us about when and how we can avoid the worst of war and understand better it's the, the costs of war and uh, how, how we can move forward differently. So John, do we have David online? Hi, Bill. David, how are you? I am good, how are you? Um, good, well, thank I, you. I, I was just celebrating your, uh, your work with us in Burundi and, and realizing that Nelson Mandela would have applauded you for the message you brought, because Burundi clearly could have avoided a horrific civil war if they if it things had been a little different. So let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Bill. I don't know about that, but I certainly applaud his work, and I will and I appreciate you including me here. And I will set a little twenty minute timer here and see what I can say in twenty minutes, because I could do ten hours on this topic if you don't stop me. Um. I, I, I do think actually we can avoid all wars. And I think most people would agree on most specific wars that they were obviously unnecessary if people had made other choices. It's only particular wars that you've seen thousands of movies and comic books and books and, and histories misleadingly you about that, that anyone imagines um, are, are somehow necessary. I'm gonna try and share screen here and see how this goes. So let me know if you can see a, a, a PowerPoint here, um, and I will see if I can get to the next slide. So there, this is a, a, a you know, war I, I want to present uh, today as a health issue, and it is a health issue, and it's been taken up as such occasionally by doctors and medical professionals and medical institutions, uh, including the American Public Health Association, which has set up a committee for years now to work on a, trying to somehow address the health threat of war and militarism. And, and this is a quote from an article in a, a medical journal in June 2014 uh, that lists numbers of wars in numbers of locations and estimates of dead, 190 million deaths 
directly and indirectly from wars in the 20th century, uh, more than the previous four centuries, uh, which yes, had somewhat smaller populations on the globe. Uh, and this is a trend that has not led up in the 21st century. Um, and, and so this is medical professionals looking at this as a health issue, as a major threat uh, and, and I think there are no two people who will ever agree exactly on the exact numbers of wars and deaths, but I would like it if reasonable people would not define most wars as civil wars and then not count them, or define most of the dead as non-civilian and thereby not count them, or compare the percentages of nations or tribes killed in ancient wars to the percentages of the whole Earth's population killed in recent local wars. Uh, in order to declare that peace has arrived and we're just too jaded to see it, all of which has been done. Um, it, not that it matters, I think, if one imagines that everything used to be worse um, or if everything did used to be worse uh, or that because other types of violence have in fact diminished in some societies, therefore we must imagine that war is on the way out as well. As long as we grasp that war isn't actually leaving on its own, <laughs> that it needs to be made to, uh, and that it constitutes a major health crisis of deaths, of injuries, of homelessness, of ongoing deprivation, environmental pollution, and worst of all, a deadly diversion of resources. Let me see if I can click the next slide without losing the whole thing. Uh, so there, there has, of course, for at least, uh, uh, at least since the mid 19th century, been a, a major effort to reform war, to make war more healthy, more acceptable, more respectable, not as deadly, not as torturous and murderous. Uh, and, and I think obviously any reform of war that succeeds even a tiny bit is quite obviously and indisputably better than nothing, unless it takes away from preventing entire wars or from shifting resources to preventing entire wars or to human and environmental needs. Um, and, and, and so despite the fact that war is itself illegal in its entirety under numerous laws and treaties, we have endless discussion of laws of war, of, of ways to do war legally. Uh, even ways to authorize and start wars, uh, supposedly legally. Uh, we have notions that come out of ancient just war theory of, you know, non-combatants being immune uh, from war, as if war were sort of an extra violent football game scheduled and held in on a battlefield or a stadium. Uh, and, you, and you obviously don't attack the fans, only the players. And, and, and that's not far off from how some wars used to be, but it has very little relationship to uh, virtually any current war. Uh, wars are fought in cities and villages and from the air. Uh, and we have myths about the precision of weapons. We have uh, notions of using robots in war. And, and people have literally told me, uh, better to have a drone war because with a drone war, nobody gets hurt. Uh, which requires rethinking who counts as nobody, but also the, the mythology ar around the idea that people are being properly identified and targeted with precision, uh, all of which is you know, radically false. Uh, and we have these leftovers from just war thinking, if we can dignify it with that term of intentions, for example. So you drop a bomb on a city, but as long as you only intended to kill one person, you didn't intend to kill all the other people. You know, we, we, have, to, we have to overcome a lot of these ways of thinking about war. War is in fact not a two-sided violent sport. It is one-sided slaughter. This is a quote from that same article in that medical journal uh, asserting that in recent wars, 85 to 90 percent uh, of the deaths have been civilian. Uh, this, like any other number, is disputable um, and, and in no way <laughs> verifiable uh, with precision. Uh, but there is no question 
that a huge number of deaths, the vast majority of deaths in recent wars are civilian by anybody's definition of civilian and that civilian deaths are not an aberration, not some minor part of war. Uh, it, it, there's also, I think, a problem with the acceptance of non-civilian deaths, uh, as well as with the identification uh, of any unknown person who dies as by default a non-civilian. Uh, you know, if if your if your city is is attacked, uh, I, I don't think you're going to immediately focus on drawing a distinction between those who fight back or resist an occupation in any way and those who don't. Uh, and, and the former, it's perfectly fine to murder them and the latter, it's not, it's a, it's a, it's a troubled distinction, I think. Um, and I think the one-sidedness of wars uh, between rich nations and poor nations is a problem. Uh, people in the United States imagine that U.S. deaths, uh, which are typically less than 1% uh, in recent wars, are a significant percentage of the deaths in these wars because they don't grasp the extent to which uh, it's one-sided slaughter, not even counting the, uh, the lingering effects of the polluted environment and the refugee crises and the ongoing trauma. Um, and that's a big part of it. Uh, we have infrastructure destroyed. We have ecosystems destroyed. We have soil and air and water poisoned and contaminated uh, effectively forever in some cases. Uh, we have refugee crises uh, currently the biggest ever seen principally uh, created by wars, unnecessary wars by any reasonable analysis. Uh, we have huge impact on the climate unmentioned in Glasgow, shut out from COP26. You can go to COP26.info and sign a petition from hundreds of organizations and tens of thousands of people asking that uh, the, the nations cease excluding military pollution from climate agreements. Uh, but it is excluded, uh, despite being a major contributor that the US military alone, if it were a nation, uh, you know, consumes more petroleum than three quarters of the nations uh, on Earth. Uh, then you have the damage uh, of, of nuclear weapons, nuclear testing, and the growing risk of nuclear apocalypse, a risk that has been growing uh, right alongside the growing risk of climate apocalypse. And, you know, thank goodness we talk about one of them to some significant extent now. Uh, we ought to talk about both. Um, and, and one of them is, you know, majorly exacerbated by militarism. The other couldn't exist without militarism. Uh, and, and militarism is, you know, a, a driver of poverty, a concentrator of wealth, a diverter of resources, uh, and is not, in fact, the, the jobs program that it's rather sociopathically but falsely sold as uh, in some quarters. Um, a problem with war in its impact on human health and well-being is what it does to encourage lawlessness. Uh, it, it is a lawless act uh, with numerous, uh, you know, redundantly lawless acts within it. But in the case of the United States in particular, it leaves behind bases uh, and establishes bases in other people's countries that hold themselves above the rule of local laws. Uh, the, these bases and these militaries hold themselves above pandemic protocols and have arguably been a little discussed major contributor to the spread of the current disease pandemic uh, above climate agreements, uh, in, engage in clearly and directly anti-health measures like the phony vaccine, uh, phony polio vaccine program in Pakistan where they were actually rather ridiculously trying to test people's blood to see if they were related to Osama bin Laden, but effectively discouraged people uh, from going anywhere near polio vaccines and uh, caused violent attacks on, on health workers with legitimate vaccines, et cetera. Um, the, the, the murder exception that war creates in, in people's minds and in, and in 
written legal theories where murder is is murder unless it's part of a war and then it's okay the this the sabotage of the international criminal court and international law in general the 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 hostile actions toward other nations that support it the resistance to human rights treaties the united states being a major outlier uh having not signed and ratified more major human rights and disarmament treaties and torn up the latter uh than any other countries uh the sanctions uh you can argue about whether un authorized sanctions uh are legal or moral but uh quite clearly us uh unilateral sanctions and the, the sanctioning of other governments that violate their sanctions on a particular country uh, are, are violations of the Geneva Convention and are going around the United Nations and are deadly and are counterproductive on their own terms uh, and, and fuel this, this lawlessness. Um, the arming and training and funding of brutal governments. You take a take a list of the 50 most oppressive governments uh, generated by a US funded think tank uh, and 48 of them, 96% of them are, are armed, trained and or funded by the US uh, and the facilitation of coups and, and so forth. Um, and this is all before we get to what I think is the, the least discussed but the most significant factor, which is the diversion of resources. Um, where to put the money, putting money into weapons, uh, even weapons that don't work, even weapons the military doesn't want, but Congress members fund for the jobs in their districts, uh, causes more death, has caused more death and suffering uh, than all the wars thus far uh, have directly inflicted. Um, you see the billboard there that World Beyond War put up, 3% uh, of US military spending could end starvation on earth. This is taking a 30 billion a year figure from the United Nations and assuming a, a trillion or more in military spending, which there in fact is across multiple departments and agencies. Uh, and, and so moving a little fraction of money out of militarism into environmental protection or humanitarian needs uh, would actually do far more good than getting every law and regulation and standard of proper humanitarian war complied with absolutely. Here's another, another graphic uh, suggesting that you could do all of these medical things beyond the world's needs uh, instead of annual global military spending. So if you go to worldbeyondwar.org, uh, or if we have time, you can ask me uh, about each of these topics. The, the, you see on worldbeyondwar.org's homepage, these links, uh, each of these things would be clickable. And, and, and so we have an argument to, to make that war is not inevitable, ever, is not justified, ever, is not necessary, ever, is not beneficial, ever. Uh, that, that is, any benefits are wildly outweighed by the disadvantages. Uh, and, and then we have these eight arguments for why end war that are helpful for building coalitions and explaining the damage done, not just by a particular war, but by the institution of war, the, the incredible investment uh, in militarism. It's immoral, it endangers rather than protects, it erodes liberties in the name of freedom, it promotes bigotry uh, historically and currently uh, consistently as well as being fueled by bigotry. It, it wastes trillions of dollars. It threatens the environment. It impoverishes us, doesn't enrich us. And there are alternatives to each and every war. Um, and, and I think because I'm in the United States and I, and I think most, if not all of you are in the United States, we should be aware that this is a different topic in the United States than anywhere else. Uh, the US militarism is not like anybody else's. Some 95% of military bases on other people's soil are US foreign military bases. Nobody, no, this isn't normal. Uh, roughly half of military spending is US military spending. Much of the rest of the world's uh, military spending is on US weaponry. The U.S. is the top weapons dealer uh, to rich countries, poor countries, oppressive countries, so-called democracies, etc. 
Uh, most of the places we think of as violent don't manufacture any war weapons. They, they are imported to these places. Um, and, and so, yes, other nations really are horrible. Um, I, I, there aren't any good ones out there, but threatening them with war doesn't improve them. Um, ceasing to prop up horrible governments, ceasing to remain an outlier on treaties and bodies of law, instituting democracy rather than bombing people in its name might do more good. I mean instituting democracy in your own country. Um, when you talk about uh, war and abolishing war and not just this bad war or that misguided war or this war where in which mistakes were made, uh, especially in the United States, uh, the inevitable uh, question, I, I, I would love to be proved wrong, but I'm sure we will be talking about this topic momentarily, is World War II. What about World War II? What about Hitler? Hitler's going to get us. What about World War II? Uh, I mean, 99% uh, of, of the time, this is the big concern. Uh, and, and it's, and it's, I don't want to say reasonable, but it is the topic, it is the top subject of U.S. entertainment, U.S. history, fiction, nonfiction. I mean, it's the founding myth. Uh, I mean, last week, the Smithsonian Magazine had a big article about how King George III was more democratic and humanitarian than the, the colonists uh, fighting for liberty in, in the United States, and, and, and nobody cared. You know, that's not, that's not the origin myth of the United States anymore. It's World War II. Uh, and, and so if you peruse the table of contents here of this book I've written, Leaving World War II Behind, and, and we've published most or all of it uh, as articles you can get for free without buying the book at worldbeyondwar.org, you, you get a sense that there are some arguments for how exactly World War II could and should have been avoided, as well as how ridiculous it is uh, to be taking the, the biggest thing the US government has done for 75 years uh, with dozens and dozens of horrible wars that nobody will praise and justifying it with something that happened in a completely different world and state of law and, and foreign relations and colonialism 75 years ago. Um, or there's the rest of the table of contents. Um, and, and so I, I think this is the last slide I have on here. Um, World Beyond War started with a petition uh, that we now have uh, signatures on by individuals and organizations in 192 countries. Uh, and uh, climbing slowly because there aren't that many countries left, uh, but adding people and organizations in each of those countries. Um, and this is the this is that public statement or petition uh, that we deliver uh, to anyone we think it can or should influence. Um, and it says, I understand that wars and militarism make us less safe rather than protect us, that they kill, injure, and traumatize adults, children, and infants, severely damage the natural environment, erode civil liberties, and drain our economies, siphoning resources from life-affirming activities. I commit to engage in and support nonviolent efforts to end all war and preparations for war and to create a sustainable and just peace. And I think I have 10 seconds left there on the clock, so I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much for including me. Thank, thank you very much, David. Um, we're starting having some questions in the chat. I don't know if you'd like to pick them up out of the chat or you'd like me to read oh, them out of the chat, whichever you, way. Which, oh, whichever you prefer. Um, you, want me to, you want me to just look at the chat and you tell me if I missed something? The first question in the chat, I'll just start with that one. Okay. Bill West had a question about, what about surgical engagements such as the one with Bin Laden? surgical engagements. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, did, Bin Laden was the purported justification uh, for a major assault and invasion and occupation uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, and the fact that the Washington Post, New York Times, CNN, all the networks and newspapers were reporting at the time that the government of Afghanistan was willing to turn bin Laden over to some third nation to be put on trial, uh, and the United States did not want that, wanted a war. And now, 20 years later, 
The New York Times reports the exact opposite, uh, that the United States wanted bin Laden put on trial, even in a third country, and, and Afghanistan wanted a war. Uh, ought, to, ought to tell you something about how we learn and understand uh, U.S. wars, um, but to take but to take a, a, a terrorist organization that was a handful of individuals hiding in caves in one country and turn it into global networks of anti-U.S. terrorist groups spread across the capitals of North Africa and Central Asia and the Middle East, uh, and, and then because you know halfway through these decades of of endless destruction, bin Laden died and call it surgical. Uh, you know, when, when, when Tony Blair insisted on a war on Afghanistan before he would commit the UK to a war on Iraq, and the United States said, okay, let's have a war on Afghanistan and then a war on Iraq. Uh, and they had you know, several more plans, some of which they got to. Uh, and, and, and you have millions of people dead and millions of people homeless. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what, I, I, I guess the, the surgicalness of it is, is a raid on a house in Pakistan. Uh, preceded, as discussed earlier, by a phony polio vaccine program, uh, uh, et, et cetera, uh, not to mention, you know, the, the, the endless bombing and slaughter and kicking in of doors uh, across Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq. Um, I, I, I don't know, but uh, if, if we were to imagine none of that contest existed and somebody just did a did a raid on a house uh, to murder someone, uh, and despite the the pretense that it was you know capture or kill, it was not. It was kill and avoid capture. Uh, and, and you know what what can I say other than killing one person or a handful of people is much better than killing hundreds of thousands of people. But it isn't good. It isn't the rule of law. It you know it's. It, it's a lynching. It's you know, and it doesn't it doesn't matter whether the person, uh, whether you imagine without any trial that the person was obviously guilty of horrendous crimes or not. Uh, it still isn't law enforcement. It, it still isn't uh, conduct that one would want to model for others in the world. So any other? There's Questions are bouncing in now. <laughs> You're gonna pick one of those three you just bounced in. Oh, what, what should I be looking at? Uh, let's um, see. The last one I see is I don't think anyone likes war in the USA. However, many of us remember Pearl Harbor attack by Japan and 9/11 attack in New York City on 9/11. This makes us feel insecure and wants us to make sure the USA has a strong military. Um, well, I'm not. I'm not sure if the questioner is uh, is already in agreement with me that uh, propaganda, when it's good, makes you afraid, and fear makes you bad at thinking, and being bad at thinking makes you accept uh, bad remedies for the fear, or whether the questioner really wants me to address some of the the myths and misunderstandings around. Pearl Harbor and 9-11, um, but I have written about both at enormous length. Um, and uh, needless to say, uh, a, a crime ought to be prosecuted as a crime <laughs> and attacks on the very same buildings in New York City, not to mention others around the world, had previously been prosecuted as crimes. Uh, and the notion that a crime is actually somehow a legal or moral or practical justification for a much bigger crime, uh, you know, just, doesn't make sense to me. Um, and uh, when, when you have, you know, vastly more lives threatened uh, by, the, by the lack of resources, uh, by bad public policies uh, of all variety, um, by homegrown terrorism and other violence, uh, the notion that we need 
to take trillions of dollars uh, and invest it in a counterproductive uh, mass murder organization because uh, of a particular horrible crime, uh, you know, it doesn't it, it doesn't make sense. Um, why, why is every other country on earth uh, able to supposedly defend itself with a radically smaller military? Why is every single nation on earth closer to Costa Rica's budget of zero dollars for its military than to the US budget for its military? Uh, why does this 4% of humanity need such great protection. Uh, and, and of course, you come to understand that it's counterproductive, you know, that if that if Canada wanted anti-Canadian terrorist networks on a U.S. scale, it would have to kick in a lot of doors. Uh, but uh, but it but it also is driven first and foremost by the profiteering, uh, you know, that the expansion of NATO that kept the Cold War going was was first and foremost customers for US weapons dealers in in Eastern Europe the the you know this is this is the driving force well I maybe I should switch yeah. to another so, question so Kip and Kip and Lloyd both thank you for sharing your views and um, Kip has a two-part question first is how is just peace defined and who defines it and the second part of the question is also how are irrational actors dealt with in your opinion um well, I, I I think it's you know important that that peace include the absence of war. Uh, I, I think for it to be lasting, uh, it can't be unjust. It can't impose uh, horrible injustices on people and build up resentment uh, if if it's going to last. Um, but I, I think there's always a danger of saying, you know, first we must pursue justice and then we'll have peace because it's very hard to have justice when bombs are falling on you. Uh, peace really is necessary uh, for justice, uh, but justice is necessary for peace to last. Uh, and that means a reasonable degree of, 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 of liberty and self-determination and uh, and. Uh, and, and security of, of health and well-being uh, for everyone, uh, or it's not going to last. Um, how are irrational actors dealt with? Um, well, I mean, in a whole variety of ways. I mean, we elect them president. Here in Virginia, we elect them governor. I, I mean, there are irrational people uh, uh, everywhere. I do irrational things myself. Um, but I think the notion that, well, people with a certain language and skin color and religion and nationality are not totally human, they're a little bit monsters, and so we can't prosecute them for crimes as if they could stand in a court. We, we really need to just bomb them, and we're sorry about anybody who's nearby, but that's just what you have to do if somebody's irrational. I don't buy it. I, I do not buy it. Um, I, 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 I absolutely do not think. Uh, I, I mean, when the peace activists were demanding that the that the Jews and others threatened uh, in Nazi territories be brought out, uh, and you know the 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 the, the, the modern notion is that. Well, that's crazy because you couldn't go negotiate with Hitler. He's irrational. He's the epitome of the irrational being that that must be dealt with. Uh, and yet that's not what the State Department or the British uh, Foreign Secretary was saying. They were saying we, we're too busy fighting a war. We don't have any interest in that. Leave us alone. Don't bother us. Uh, and what they were saying behind closed doors was uh, Hitler would go would go for that in a minute, but but it would inconvenience our friends who don't want all those Jews, uh, you know. So the talk of irrational creatures in war propaganda, I think, has to be questioned. Uh, and then maybe there's a different question that I that I'm not grasping. Okay, I think we have time for one more here. Lloyd, ask a question, and and then we're going to take a break. I need about three minutes to finish up, and then if you 
we're finish the formal meeting and then stick around and we're hit the rest of the questions after 1 p.m. <laughs> so Lloyd asked a question, is there ever a singular defensive war? <laughs> Well, yes and no. I, I mean, there was great wisdom in the kellogg briand Pact simply banning all war or even go back to the Hague uh, Convention of 1907 requiring peaceful settlement of disputes, both of which are just routinely violated. Uh, and there was a huge danger uh, in creating a loophole in the UN Charter for, for defensive wars, not because one nation can't attack another, and when the other fights back, you can accurately characterize it as defensive. Uh, but because every participant in every war always characterizes their side as defensive, uh, and in many cases, uh, neither one is. Uh, in most cases, uh, neither one is. Um, but here's the thing, if your nation is preparing for uh, defense military style uh, and has put its government, its Congress at the beck and call of the weapons profiteers. Uh, and if the, you know, it's relatively tiny infrastructure and human needs bills are discussed as the most gargantuan expense in history while a much larger military bill slides through unnoticed. Uh, then you're going to generate enemies and wars, which is the opposite of defense. And if you're one of those small, poor nations that gets attacked from the outside uh, relatively innocently, uh, what is the best defense? The evidence, uh, I think Erica Chenoweth's database on this and the, the evidence of numerous scholars is very clear now that nonviolent resistance to even to military occupations is more likely to succeed. Uh, and that success is likely to be far longer lasting because of the, the need for justice uh, touched on earlier. Uh, and, and so uh, a, a defensive war is not necessarily a defensible war or a wise or a moral war. Uh, but if the United States uh, goes to war with Iraq and Iraq fights back, I don't think anybody, uh, I, I don't think anybody anywhere, no matter their view of anything, disputes uh, that one party attacked and the other didn't. Thank you very much, David. And we're going to take a three minutes. I can close up. And then for those who can hang on, we can finish up. David's agreed to stay on and finish up the questions after we do our closing. And those who have more questions, please hang on. Just some reminders coming up. We have um, upcoming program after at 1.30 today, we have the Peace Builder Fellowship. If you can stay on for that, it'd be great. David's gonna stay on. And also um, this evening, we have our evening, evening meeting to this evening. It's at the No Code Distillery. If you can. Next week coming up, coffee and conversation on Tuesday. Please join us at the cart Tuesday morning early. Next week, we are at the Lincoln Center at noon with the, P with the History Fellowship following the meeting at noon. Also next Thursday, the um, Brew Fellowship will meet at the um, Peculiar Ales in Windsor, if you can make it there, always a fun event. Lastly, one more plug, please. Um, the link for the holiday party was in the chat. Please RSVP or please see or talk to Judy Boggs, she'll be there to um, get your tickets next at next Wednesday's meeting. It's gonna be a great event. Lastly, if you please unmute yourself and join us in the four-way test to close our meeting. <laughs> of the things we think, say, or do. Is, Is it, it the, the truth? 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 Is it beneficial to all concerned? Thank you very much to all. And for all who can stay on, we will be continuing. For all who cannot stay on, we will see you next Wednesday at the Lincoln Center. Thanks, John. Well done. David, there's a few more 
questions right in the chat. If you want to just pick through them or I can shout some out. We get a little more informal now. I hit to unmute. Well, let me see if I can unmute. Um, I, I can try my best to take some and you can tell me if I'm missing any and make sure I get them. I, I see one that says uh, right after, is there ever a singular defensive war? There's one that says, okay, I agree 9-11 was a crime in quotes uh, by extremists, but was not Pearl Harbor a whole country, Japan attacking the US unprovoked? What should have been the response of the US in your view to Pearl Harbor? Um, well, we can quibble about whether a government is a whole country. Um, I, I don't think, I think there's often an important distinction between an entire population of people and its government. I think it's, uh, I, I think it's noteworthy that the US ambassador, Joseph Grew, and, the, and the, the president of the upper house in Japan, Prince Tokugawa, were, were very much against war. And it was, you know, not long after the latter's death uh, that Japan got really got into World War II. Um, and uh, Japan, like the United States, had huge numbers of people for peace and huge numbers of people for war. Um, but the government uh, of Japan uh, was behind the, you know, and the, and the military arm of the government of Japan was behind an attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, on the same day uh, that Japan attacked numerous islands and nations around the Pacific, including uh, up in Alaska and down in the Philippines and, and Guam. And, uh, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these were major occupations begun that day that did far more extensive damage to material and, and property and uh, and death and injury and destruction. Um, I, I mean, and the, the airplanes that Douglas MacArthur uh, inexplicably left lined up on the runway for hours and hours until Japan had a chance to destroy them all uh, in the Philippines, you know, was far more destruction than, you know, temporarily sinking a, a handful of, of ships, most of which were, you know, brought back up and put into the war in, in Pearl Harbor. Uh, but Pearl Harbor was what became the propaganda name uh, because there were just more white people in Hawaii and it was thought of more as a potential future state and it could be mischaracterized as an attack on the United States of America. Uh, but of course, that attack followed decades of the, the hawk elements in the US and Japanese governments, both uh, escalating toward war. Uh, the US war plans uh, were published in a newspaper in Chicago days before Pearl Harbor. Uh, the newspapers in Honolulu, Hawaii, warned of the attack uh, coming on the weekend. Uh, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't a surprise. Uh, the US military had been told to go to war. Roosevelt had instituted the draft, had generated the list of all Japanese Americans to be identified and harassed and, and mistreated. Uh, it, the, the, the war was underway. In fact, the United States was providing airplanes and pilots and guidance and trainers to the Chinese uh, before Pearl Harbor. Uh, and, and I think critically, had cut off uh, key supplies of, of metal and other resources to Japan, had sanctioned Japan uh, as a key step on a list of a couple dozen steps the US government had explicitly drawn up for how to provoke Japan into a war uh, and had you know, checked them off um, as it went through them. Uh, so that one of the jurors, not the, not the full body, but one of the jurors in the post-war tribunals in Tokyo concluded that the United States had provoked uh, the attack, uh, none of which, you know, goes one iota to making a murderous, uh, horrific criminal uh, attack anything other than murderous and horrific and criminal, uh, or excuses the Japanese government in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but it takes two to tango, uh, and it, you know, 
maybe some of you, certainly I, would have been going to the peace rallies against the the insane buildup to a war between the U.S. and Japan for many years prior to Pearl Harbor. I mean, everybody knew it was coming, and the and the war exercises, the the showing off of the ships uh, in the Pacific, the building of the U.S. bases on islands around the Pacific, the warnings from the U.S. ambassador to Japan, the warnings from the Japanese government. Uh, I, I mean, this, this bizarre notion of, you know, of an attack on an innocent out of the blue doesn't doesn't fit what we know actually happened, uh, which was that Franklin Roosevelt wanted into the war in Europe, uh, and this was a way to do it. In fact, on the on the 7th of December, he drafted a, a resolution for war on both Japan and Germany until he was talked out of it. So, um should what should have been the response uh you know always picks the key propaganda moment right there never should have been that build up to war uh once there was that build up to war and there weren't the 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 courts and institutions that there are now uh you know the i i think the world should have done its its best to put an end to the war, uh, which is a little different, at least, from escalating it, uh, and you know, from from dramatically escalating it uh, into numerous nations uh, and with firebombs and nuclear weapons and so forth. Uh, I, I mean, that's that's not a, a defensible response um I, I i think if if you're going i i think efforts certainly could have been made in the you know in this bizarre you know fictional history uh to hold japan to account uh without uh without anything resembling the sort of violence that was engaged in um let's see um right, guys on the call guy do you want to just ask your question <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Sure. My question is, um, it's nice to point out the rational basis uh, for not going to war or maintaining peace, but the practical matter is that we do go to war, and we've been going to war, um, and in fact, it was even written in, uh, in the history of uh, Henry IV and Henry uh, Henry V. On Henry IV's dying deathbed, he told Henry V's son, things aren't going well at home here. We're going to have a civil war. Uh, I, my advice is to go start a foreign war. And often, and maybe just in the last 20 years, we've experienced the same thing. Domestically, we we are uh, not investing in ourselves. We have dissatisfaction at home. Uh, we have a population that is further divided in wealth. And uh, one, a simple way to, to fix that is to rally around the flag, literally. And if you notice, if you read my chat, after you know uh, the first few months of President W. Bush's presidency, his popularity, his approval rating was probably around where Biden is right now. But after he invaded Afghanistan, it shot to 90%. After he invaded Iran, it shot to 90% too. And uh, so how, you know, it, this is steep, not in just in trying to, how do you change the culture and education? Uh, at some very fundamental levels, it's not just irrational leaders, um, people are voting for these and following these leaders, um, the vast majority. So that's my question. I, yes, excellent question. A very important question. We have to change the culture. I, I'm going to translate Iran into Iraq uh, because thank God nobody did invade Iran. Uh, completely different nation. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm going to quibble with the notion that uh, you know that that the public is overwhelmingly for war, um, 
you know, I, I think it's it's worth noting how dramatically the U.S. public was against war in the 20s and 30s uh, and how close the U.S. government came to giving people the right to a public referendum before the U.S. government would go to war uh, and how important Franklin Roosevelt thought it was to, to block that uh, and to have the government remain able to go to war with or without public approval and, and stay at war. Um, and I think it, it's worth noting uh, that, that vastly more U.S. presidents uh, have been elected promising peace, uh, including Roosevelt, wouldn't talk about World War II until after another election, including Woodrow Wilson, promised to stay out of World War I until right after he got elected. Richard Nixon got elected promising a secret plan for peace. It's still secret. Uh, Bush the first big war ratings, and they didn't last long at all. Bush II, those big war ratings, and didn't last long at all. Uh, Trump elected claiming to be anti-war, uh, Hillary Clinton losing one among many uh, reasons uh, because voters in key Midwestern states thought she was too pro-war. Um, and, and so, yes, people elect Congress members and presidents uh, who are recklessly and horrifically uh more pro-war than they should be. Um, but I would trade the U.S. Congress and the White House for public referenda any day. Uh, you know, we never would have had a war on Libya. We never would have had uh, these wars on Syria. Um, it, it, we never would have had, uh, you know, if when you when you ask the U.S. public about the war on Afghanistan, yeah, you had a majority at the start. Within a year and a half, and from that point to this, you had a majority saying no, never should have done it. Same with Iraq. You, you, you arguably had close to a majority at the start. Within a year and a half and ever since, you had a vast, strong majority saying no, never should have done it. Uh, and so, you know, with people blaming public pressure for ending the war on Afghanistan after 20 years, if public pressure had been decisive uh, all by itself, you could have cut out 18 and a half of those years of, of the war on Afghanistan. Uh, that being said, we have a war culture, a culture that accepts war, even if it doesn't cheer for it uh, and, uh, and, and largely ignores it, largely accepts the, the narrative that these infrastructure bills and human needs bills are big gargantuan expenses well, the military costs nothing or is just sort of flows with it's just sort of a natural occurrence and is unquestionable and must go on. Uh, and if you look at, at Congress members' campaign websites, the vast majority of them don't mention war, peace, treaties, international law, the budget, the military budget, the existence of 96% of humanity that lives outside the United States at all whatsoever. It's, you know, it's over half the money they're going to be voting on, the job they're campaigning to be elected to, but they don't mention it. And people let them get away with that. Uh, you know, and we had, we had such strong public opinion in 2006 on ending the war in Iraq, you know, <laughs> years after you had the polls saying never should have started it, uh, which is different from polls saying end it now because it's somehow anti-troop to end the war the troops are in. You have to kill more because you already killed some, even though polls of the active duty troops say they want to end it. I, I can't make sense of it. But anyway, you had polls saying never should have been done. 2006, you had the top answer to all the exit polls saying we just gave the Democrats the House and the Senate to end the war on Iraq. Uh, and the fact that the Democrats came in and said, we're going to escalate it instead of ending it so that we can campaign against it again in 2008. Uh, and the fact that you had all the, the funders of the peace organizations say, we're going to fund a Democratic presidential campaign in 2008 and took all their money out of the peace organizations in 2007. Uh, and, and the fact that people, people learned too much of a lesson from 2003. They thought they had gone in the streets and opposed a war and did no good. 
And the fact that they won over lots of nations and won over the United Nations and created a global movement with all kinds of offshoots that led to all kinds of peace and justice uh, movements and actions in different parts of the world, uh, it didn't really register. They just thought it was all pointless and, 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 and we, we were just failures. Uh, and, and so a lot of that sort of tamped down the, the, the interest in the, in the public in opposing war. Uh, and we've been working and need to keep working on bringing it back up and beyond that to the, to the level of 1920s and beyond that. Uh, and any, any ideas, uh, Guy, you or anybody else has for how to do it, um, I'm all ears. Well, I can't say because I'm an electrician in my house. Well, let me hear your uh, hearing Stacey, somebody, but yes, Stacy had one question in the chat there, and I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna stop reading questions, and um, everyone can just um, unmute and go for it. <laughs> I think, <laughs> and Bill Timpson can take over the, the transition to the I think transition to the Peace Fellowship. Well, the the question I had, let me let me preface this just slightly. Um, I have a very good friend who owns, whose family has owned a, an instrument company in Germany since uh, early, since the end of 1890s, well before the 20th century. In 1940, in 1935, two years after Hitler was elected, uh, the Nazi government came to the founder of that, that uh, instrument company and said, we want you to build a new factory to build, to uh, produce instruments for building um, automobile engines, or I should say just engines in general. So uh, automobile, anything that, that moves the engine that would move it. Um, and they said, oh, by the way, we want you to put it in this little town called uh, Göttingen up in Northern Germany, way away from anything else, way away from rail yards, way away from population centers, anything else. What became clear at that point, what should be clear, is that Hitler had decided at that point that he was going to prosecute a war. Now, I think we all understand that uh, uh, we, we precipit precipitated that in some ways with the punishment of Germany after World War I because of the way we treated them, that we, we precipitated the rise of a person like Hitler that the Germans elected. Now, my real question is, um, what you've, you've spoken great about the eloquently about the uh, moral issues of war and the moral op, moral opposition to war. What about the economics? How do we remove profitability from war, and wouldn't that reduce the need to go to war, the the uh, instance of going to war, the push for war, dramatically if we could reduce the profitability of war? I think so, absolutely. I just uh, yesterday, I think I. I wrote a review of Andrew Coburn's new book, Spoils of War, which really makes a case that, that the profits uh, from the weapons uh, and the war industries uh, is the top motivator uh, behind the wars and the war uh, machine. Uh, it's not the only uh, factor there. The political factors a uh, guy mentioned, there's the bureaucratic inertia, there's the, 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 the misguided humanitarianism and the misguided sadism and, and all sorts of other factors, but it's, it's first and foremost the profits. Uh, and if you could get them out, uh, it would make a world of difference. Or if you could even keep them out of the political system, it would make a world of difference. It's not just the profits, but the corruption that comes out of those profits. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, it, 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 the, that, it's, that it's the profits, I think, is, is in part made clear, and Andrew Coburn documents this very well, from the fact that, uh, that the more spent uh, generally means the less military on its own terms, you know, even if you're a pro-military, military guy who thinks militarism is the greatest thing ever and we need it and it's defensive and good and humanitarian and responsible, the more money being dumped into it, the less you're getting back because the, the fancier, more complicated weapons uh, cost more, but you buy fewer of them. The, the, the weapons that work less well, that break, uh, that blow up or don't work, or the computer falls apart, or it 
can't fly or, you know, it, they make they take more money because they're simply the companies are simply paid to fix it. They're not held accountable to it. Uh, and the the weapons that don't work at all because they make the wildest claims, the, the so-called missile defense and then the Russians hypersonic missiles and now the U.S. hypersonic missiles, you know, none of which work, uh, make the most money because they make the grandest claims. Uh, and, and and so you have you have this incredibly inefficient, wasteful system, even on its own terms. But then you've legalized bribery. I mean, we're good, nice, respectable people. So we call it campaign contributions, but you've still legalized bribery. And so much of it flows into the congressional and, and presidential campaigns uh, that you have Congress, you know, buying you know, fighter jets that don't fly that the Pentagon doesn't want because of which states and districts they're manufactured in. Um, and, and so if you could get that corruption out of the system, uh, you know, and one way to do it, one way to do it would be to make it acceptable to create jobs that aren't military jobs. Um, because I think it's important for us to remember that the military is not a jobs program, that, the mil that military spending eliminates jobs, doesn't generate jobs. And people will say, how the hell is that possible? Because I, my the guy next door to me works for a military subcontractor and he's a real person with a real job. Uh, but of course, you spend the same money on other things, you get more jobs. You even don't tax it in the first place, you get more jobs. Uh, and, and so it's not an economic benefit to any population in general. It's just a huge benefit to a small number of people and the, the politicians they buy. Um, and, and so if you could get that corruption out by saying, to, because Congress members have always said to us, no, no, we can't invest in green energy jobs or infrastructure jobs or, or education jobs. It's war jobs or nothing. Take it or leave it. If we could change that, if, you know, if some shred of the, the Build Back Better bill survives and has some shred of that in it, uh, or, or if we otherwise can generate some sort of demilitarized Green New Deal or any sort of you know, 1930s era jobs program where you actually create decent jobs with a living wage that aren't military jobs. Well, then we could, we could go to Congress members and say, look, you could have more jobs in your district uh, that weren't military jobs uh, and it would cost less and it'd be, be better jobs and better paying and, uh, you know, not have all the disasters that go with militarism. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have an answer to how we get there by tomorrow. If somebody does, um, I want to hear it. But it, but it, if enough people understood, as you guys seem to understand, that this is the problem, uh, that would be a huge step in the right direction. So in terms of solutions, David, do you need a five minute break before we start the 1.30 to 2.30 session? Do you what need is, a break? No, I don't. What's the 1.30 to 2.30? Oh, 1.30, we have a peace fellowship. So we have a regular program you've been speaking to, then we take a short break, and then some other folks gather on this site to ask questions of you. I sent it out on our newsletter and other people will be dialing in with other questions and all that. So, Well, so I'm the, afraid they may be the same questions, so I'll try to give different answers. And, yeah, that uh, would be great, that'd be great. <laughs> but but let's, let's take five minutes, okay? Can you benefit sure. from five minutes? Uh, sure. Yeah, okay. So let's everybody take five minutes and then we'll restart at uh, 1.30, which will be in 30 seconds.
David, this is Bob Maroney. Earlier, you uh, mentioned that um, the U.S. has been reluctant to take its place in those treaties that uh, tend to reduce war. And uh, I was wondering if you were familiar with the Congressional uh, House Rep Act 4718, Stop Arming Human Rights Abusers Act. I am. I'm familiar with Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Uh, it's my hope that on Saturday uh, she is the most likely of any of the speakers at the activist rally in Glasgow to mention uh, the existence of militaries or their contribution to the collapse of the climate. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, a, 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 as a <laughs> as a sensible person uh, with a problem uh, with uh, with war acceptance. Uh, I find it, of course, uh, absurdly ridiculous uh, to suppose that you could give war weapons to somebody and have them use them without uh, abusing human rights. But accepting uh, the terms of, of discussion in which you know, human rights basically exist outside of war, um, to stop selling the weapons of war to governments that abuse human rights even outside of war uh, would absolutely be a step in the right direction. Uh, I mean, even if it were stop selling weapons, uh, you know, to governments uh, that with, you know, with with names that begin with letters from the first half of the alphabet, it would be a step in the right direction because you shouldn't be selling weapons uh, to anybody. Um, but it's uh, it's I think it's a smart move by Congresswoman Omar. Uh, I mean, it's it's a snowball's chance in hell in the U.S. Congress and Washington, D.C., this Congress or last Congress when she also introduced it. But uh, I think it's smart when anybody hears about it, because most people imagine it to already be the case. <laughs> most people suppose that's already a requirement. Most people think that something called the Leahy Law requires that. Uh, you know, so it's a it's not a hard sell for most people that the U.S. government shouldn't be uh, selling weapons to the most oppressive governments around the world, um, and, and it's it also uh, enters into other legislation that's been introduced um, in uh, in in both the House and the Senate members have introduced bills to to reform, as they call it, the War Powers Resolution. Um, uh, the War Powers Resolution of 1973, of course, gives Congress members a way to end wars that are underway, lets a single Congress member force a, d a debate and a vote on ending a particular war, which has been done many times in the House, but no vote ever passed until Trump was president. And then both houses voted twice each to end the war on Yemen under the War Powers Resolution and Trump vetoed. And, and then Biden became president and Congress lost interest in that and the war on Yemen, uh, you know, went on. Uh, you know, so so the most <laughs> the most useful thing would be to use the existing war powers resolution and the two bills in the House and Senate, both of them make it stronger and both of them make it weaker in different ways. But the one in the House uh, from uh, from Congressman. Uh, no, I'm going to forget his name, but well, from a number of Congress members, uh, the, the one in the House, one of the things it does is very similar to Ilhan Omar's uh bill um on you know both of both of them in the house and senate add something to the war powers resolution on weapon sales on on congressional control over weapon sales um and the house one actually you know prevents selling weapons to major human rights abusers um and you know, it's it, it, it like closing foreign bases, like getting rid of hair trigger land based nuclear weapons. It's it's one of these things that seems just quintessentially sensible and reasonable if you if you think about it for a second. But of course, 
you're talking about a government that is owned by the weapons dealers and that uses the State Department as a marketing firm. Saudi Arabia pays the United States $30 million a year for, wep for a weapons salesman crew to be stationed permanently in Saudi Arabia to sell them more weapons. I, I mean, this is big business, right? And, and so uh, it, it's a good thing. The question is, can we make it happen? Thank you. Bob, Bob Maroney, let me ask you, you wrote a very nice piece, I thought, in our newsletter on the, the complexity of peacekeeping. There are differences between separating combatants to promoting peace to building peace. Do you want to raise that question for, for David? Well, I think he's probably read my article. The title was, Can We Enforce Peace? And uh, I looked at it from sort of a historical standpoint and uh, somewhat cynically noted that the real dilemma is that everybody's a peace-loving nation until uh, it doesn't be convenient for them not to be. And it's always the other person's fault, just as David has said uh, earlier. And uh, the Hans Morgenthau argued that one of the problems is that uh, national self-interest uh, eventually governs our behavior, or at least we think it's governing our behavior in that uh, if they think that there are times when chaos or war or advances in national interest uh, are bettered by war than peace, then uh, our leadership has a horrible tendency to go that way. And uh, I must admit that uh, I'm hoping that as David suggests that uh, concentrated work by the majority can overcome that. Any thoughts, David? Uh, I agree, of course. Um, I, I, I think we should always bear in mind uh, the distinction mentioned earlier between a government and a population of, of people. Um, and I, I think, uh, I mean, one of, one of the things I like best about World Beyond War, apart from the, the work we do on education and, and activism and campaigns to divest money from weapons and close bases and so forth, is that we do events like this one where the people that I see in the gallery view are from all over the world. Uh, so that when people talk about their national self-interest or, uh, or you use the word we or us or our to mean the Pentagon, uh, it, it literally makes no sense. People literally have to ask, what do you mean exactly? <laughs> and so, um, you know, because most of us who've done peace activism have been, you know, have been locked up opposing wars and had the guy next to us say, we just bombed Kabul, you know, and it, what do you mean we, <laughs> you know, we're sitting here locked up for trying to prevent that. What do you mean we? Uh, and so I think it's, it's, it's very helpful when we starts to mean a global community of people for peace and justice, uh, rather than some, you know, national mythology or some military or some government. Um, you know, we're responsible for reining in and reforming and redirecting these governments, um, but not for identifying with them. Well, how do we, how, how do, we uh, do keeping the peace? It seems to me that in many cases, uh, maintaining peace means maintaining the status quo. And then for many nations, that means maintaining dictatorships, uh, internal brutality. Uh, do we have any responsibility or is, should we say, okay, they've got to solve their own problems? Well, I'll do my best on this one. And then I think there's another Bob who was trying to get in a question right. there. Um, uh, the, the, the notion that we, and again, I'm going to guess that you mean the U.S. government and the U.S. military when you say we have a responsibility to make people in other nations better off because they have bad governments. Um, well, I, I, I'm against vigilantism on a small scale or a large scale. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I, 
probably, you know, we would all agree on this call that, you know, my, my neighbor and his friends don't have a responsibility uh, to crack down on violence and bring law and order to the United States. The U.S. government does. Uh, by the same token, uh, the U.S. government has no right or privilege or responsibility to bring law and order to the world, certainly not by means of, of committing the biggest crimes possible. Rather, a reformed and democratized United Nations or some replacement thereof, the World Court, the International Criminal Court, the, the world community of international institutions have that responsibility. Now, should the United States uh, cease and desist making things worse? Hell yes. I, I, I mean, when, you, when you're providing weapons and training and funding to 96% of the worst governments on earth to go around moaning about your moral responsibility to make those bleep hole nations better places, uh, sort of misses the point that you're making them worse. Uh, and when you're, you know, the, the, the last remaining or darn near the last remaining holdout on so many treaties, uh, the only nation not to sign uh, the, the treaty on the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child and just about the only one of the Convention on the Rights of, of Women and, and, and all of the big human rights treaties and, and disarmament treaties and, and, and you're punishing nations that support the International Criminal Court, and you're punishing nations that try to use universal jurisdiction to prosecute crimes that are going unpunished, and, uh, and, and you're lawlessly sanctioning nations uh, and, and blockading them, punishing other nations that violate your lawless sanctions uh, to then hold a, a global democracy conference to create the, 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 a, a rule-based order you know, which apparently means whoever rules gives the orders, uh, you know, it's just too much hypocrisy to bear. Um, of course, everyone has a responsibility to everyone else. Of course, we should try to make the world a better place. Uh, but why does the U.S. government have the right to proclaim itself the, the sole bearer of responsibility to, to fix everybody else, um, whether, they, whether they want it or not. Um, you know, this is, this is where we get into trouble, I think. Good question. Bob Lawrence and then Lloyd Thomas. Bob. Well, I had a question uh, about uh, what's coming up in the future. Do you think the United States should defend Taiwan? Defend Taiwan from what? I mean, 85% well, uh, of the- invasion. Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen a Chinese invasion. I haven't heard a Chinese invasion threatened. I have, I have seen Chinese airplanes flying over the Pacific Ocean mischaracterized as flying over Taiwan or Taiwan airspace or Taiwan something else that's a pure invention. 85% of the people in Taiwan do not want to be a part of China and do not want to be liberated, rescued, democratized, defended, protected, or made a part of the United States in any way, shape, or form. They want to be left the hell alone. And if we're going to respect what people want, I mean, I know it's this bizarre situation where you're not supposed to say they aren't China, but they really mostly aren't China, and it's very, very weird. But that's kept everybody peaceful uh, and I would rather have people saying a few weird things than bombing each other. Uh, and when, when you're the US government and you're proclaiming that the people of Crimea voting on what country they wanna be part of is the biggest threat to law and order in, you know, in the past hundred years, uh, you, don't have, you don't have the right to go threatening the greatest crime there is on China in defense of people who really want to be left the hell alone. Um, I mean, it's a, we, we, have to, we have to stop imagining the knight on a white horse. We have to stop supposing that the US government is something different from a weapons dealer. It, it thinks the world makes a lot more sense if you recognize that the US government is fundamentally a weapons dealer. That, that the, all this crazy support for nuclear energy, despite the fact that it doesn't work, comes out of 
the, the lobby for nuclear weapons, that creating climate agreements that leave out major destroyers of the climate makes sense because of the, the lobby of the weapons dealers. Uh, and that 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 the, all the all everything you're hearing out of the U.S. military and and New York Times op-eds of uh, columns about about UFOs comes out of the failure to find a credible enemy here on planet Earth, uh, and everything is being done to put China into that role, to put Russia into that role. The 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 Islamic terrorist is losing his power over the U.S. public. Uh, but you, but you, but we have to be aware that that China does horrible things, that the people of Taiwan have have demands and grievances, uh, but that the interest of the U.S. government and its essentially state media, the, the U.S. television networks and newspapers, uh, is is in ginning up trouble and selling weapons, uh, and that this arming of the Pacific to the teeth is, is, you know, far more dangerous now than it was in the 1930s. Uh, you know, this time it's supposed to be the US and Japan against China rather than the US and China against Japan, but it doesn't matter for the planet. You know, we're, we're, we're all gonna die um, if this continues. Well, could I, uh, did you say that you were opposed to uh, nuclear power plants? Did I hear you say that? Uh, you didn't, but I, but you inferred it correctly. I am. Okay. Well, so, I don't want to argue with you on that, but a lot of us believe that uh, nuclear power is one responsible response to the climate change. It has nothing to do with weapons. Well, the I, I, I'm in favor, if you don't mind, of, of arguments. I don't think they have to be hostile or mean or leave bad feelings. I think it's very, very important for us to debate and discuss differences of opinion and information. Otherwise, we never learn anything from each other. Um, and, you know, without, without claiming falsely to be any sort of expert on nuclear energy, uh, there is no question that the nuclear weapons lobby wants and has pushed from the start uh, the growth and spread of, of nuclear energy. Uh, there is no question that numerous nations have acquired nuclear energy precisely in order to be a step away from having nuclear weapons. Uh, and from what I've seen of the risks and advantages and disadvantages of nuclear energy, it, it, it's a non-starter. It, it's not productive enough, fast enough of any sort of energy uh, to, to, on the scale that's needed. It doesn't compare to solar or wind or other actually clean uh, forms of energy production, uh, and nobody has figured out what to do with the waste. Uh, and, and the risk of it, the risk of, of a nuclear power plant, despite its great peaceful intentions, becoming a target of a war uh, or a terrorist attack or an accident uh, and doing the sort of damage that wars do uh, is so great that you can't insure them. You know, that the great capitalist free marketplace of the United States, you can't get an insurance company to insure the things. You have to put it on the taxpayers. And I don't want it. I don't want, I don't want the risk. I don't want the expense. I, it, it's, you know, it just, it seems to be denial of the dramatically increased and rapidly increasing capacities of really clean uh, and safe uh, energy production systems and of the need to scale back energy consumption. Let me uh, call on Lloyd and then Martin in a second. So Lloyd, you wrote a piece for us about uh, lessons from a pandemic, the war on COVID. Are there some lessons in your mind that we could bring to this issue of, of militarism and war? Well, the only, uh, I'm not sure um, I could I could probably bring a lot of lessons from what uh, David has been talking about. Uh, one of them is that uh, wars seem to be uh, self-perpetuating. 
that wars have been going on for in in the human uh, human in humanity as a species as a species for thousands and thousands of years. So I'm not sure as a clinical psychologist that I'm not sure but what it is a natural propensity of our species to solve problems by eliminating the perceived problem or the perceived people or the perceived issues uh, that uh, we think are causing the problem. And, and that's what we do with viruses. If you eliminate them, we'll solve the problem. Uh, so somewhere along the line, we have to get, get, all, get with, my, my question was gonna be to you, David, given the fact that humanity has in, been engaged in wars for ever, as far as I can tell, um, what, and I, and I know that anger kept inside is one of the causes of depression. What on earth keeps you um, from becoming overly depressed when you, when you are so much aware of all the negative stuff that war <laughs> creates? <laughs> Good question. Uh, it's a it's an important question. I don't know whether I can satisfactorily answer it from every angle, but I can I can give at least a few facts and a few opinions for what it's worth. Um, to to say that humanity has been engaged in war for thousands and thousands of years is a little bit too vague because there's human history for. 10, 20,000 years at the, at the, at the most, and, uh, and any real solid evidence of war for no further back than that, and humanity as a species for 100,000 years at least, uh, and uh, strong debate uh, in the anthropological field and, and other fields on whether anything that you could properly call war existed for most of the existence of this species, uh, of the, the hunter-gathering tribes uh, that generally uh, moved on to other territory rather than uh, fight anything that resembled a war. Um, and when you, when you look at the cases of when you look at current wars, you look at U.S. wars, uh, you know, the top killer of U.S. troops engaged in wars uh, is suicide. Uh, and most of the people who engage in the wars, even in the, even in the slightest way, uh, are horribly damaged by them. Uh, and others, of course, who are deeply in the war and the war is in their home and their village are horribly, horribly damaged. And, and you put that on one side, we're, we're trying to find the, the my, mystical, mythical human nature, put that on one side of the balance. On the other, let's add up all the cases of post-traumatic stress disorder and depression and suffering that have arisen out of war deprivation. Zero, ever anywhere on the whole goddamn planet, zero. Nobody has ever suffered from being deprived of war, right? And you say, well, there's always been a war somewhere. Well, there's always not been a war most somewheres. And even the places where there are wars, most everybody does everything they can to avoid them, including most people in the United States, where you can get a ridiculously and disgustingly high percentage of people saying to a pollster that they, quote, would participate in a war, 40% maybe. Uh, but what's preventing them, right? There's a recruiting station within a mile. Uh, and thank goodness, a lot of countries, it's down in the single digits, right, who would participate in a war. And, and so you've had human cultures, this species, Homo sapiens, uh, go for centuries without anything remotely resembling even an ancient sort of war, which was more like a football game in comparison to current war. Uh, I mean, we call the same thing war over the millennia, but the kids sitting in a trailer in Las Vegas being ordered to blow somebody up with a missile from a drone compared to the guy with the sword and the shield on the battlefield, uh, to call it the same thing is very tenuous. And, uh, and, and I really think fundamentally the problem is one of, 
of, of putting 4% of humanity on this pedestal and calling it humanity. I mean, people in the United States, in US academia, are all the time trying to figure out how they can get something to work in theory that 96% of humanity has got working in practice. And, I, and, and any problem that the United States has, well, it's just human nature. Those other 96% of humans, notwithstanding, you know, the, if, if the US government were to move 20% in the direction of the military spend of the average military spending of the other 96% of humanity I, I would declare us saved you know i would i would you know <laughs> shift the betting on human survival dramatically right uh, and, and so why why do we why do we look at 4% of humanity and its misrepresentative government that doesn't even measure up to where we are, not even close. I mean, we're mostly good people uh, and, and call that human nature. Well, the only reason you can do that, of course, is that human nature doesn't actually exist. It's, it's an excuse term. It's not something you can you know, surgically find in a, in, a, in a corpse or a living body. It, it, it's, it's just a nonsense term. Um, so, so how does all of that uh, cause me to be depressed or not be depressed? Um, I, 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 I generally, in, a, in these sorts of discussions, get accused of being an optimist. Um, and the, the fact is, I just don't think we have time for it, for, for optimism or pessimism. I, mean, I don't see a, any value in either one other than an organizing value. I, I, I mean, if, if people are success dependent, you get them to do small things like divesting their local city from weapons companies and then it encourages them to go on to bigger things like trying after their congress member um or you tell them the wars we stopped because they're all on and on about the wars we didn't stop but to my mind the the the, the satisfaction the fulfillment in life the 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 cure for you know nausea and depression is is in the work uh, and doing the work as effectively as you can in solidarity with others. Uh, it, it's not in your current prediction of whether you're going to succeed or not. And thank goodness, because my current predictions of whether we're going to succeed or not are going <laughs> off a cliff. So how how would you how would you address the dynamic that says the way to resolve problems? is to destroy your adversary. The way to destroy your adversary is to make them your friend. Uh, you, you, I, I don't, the way to That's solve the problem That's is not the to alternative, But how, how do you address the dynamic when it's believed by so many people? How do you address them? Well, I... I I mentioned earlier what the data shows. If you if you look at the the studies compiled by people like Erica Chenoweth, looking at hundreds of violent and nonviolent campaigns over the past century and a half, violence doesn't work. It doesn't succeed even half as often as nonviolence, which very often doesn't work either but it succeeds over twice as often as, as violence. Uh, and those successes overwhelmingly are far, far longer lasting. And so, so when people say, yes, yes, I agree with you, but when push comes to shove and we've tried everything and all the other resorts than the last resort, uh, we have to resort to, well, it doesn't make any sense to resort to a tool that's less likely to succeed than other, you resort to the strongest Right, and the, this whole notion of last resort never made any sense. What would that mean to run out of resorts, to exhaust all possible ideas? It, it doesn't make any sense. It, it, and if you look at any actual specific war, they've all been carefully maneuvered into. Peace has been very carefully avoided. Uh, and so, I, I mean, what would, be a, what would be a problem that had to be destroyed because when you when you sanction and threaten a government, uh, you know, and we have dozens of solid examples now, uh, the people do not rally around you against their government. They rally around their government against you. Uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't remotely begin to accomplish the purport 
purported purpose uh, of rallying the people against the government because you're punishing them, not their government. Their government's corrupt enough to stay fat and happy. Uh, you know, and, and if you don't want China committing human rights abuses, well, why are you their top customer? Why, if you don't want China committing human rights abuses, why exaggerate them ridiculously? Why not give credible reports about them? If you don't want China committing human rights abuses, why threaten China with war, which causes it to commit more and greater human rights abuses? If you don't want China committing human rights abuses, why not join international bodies of law, support the world court, support the international criminal court, Stop committing your own human rights abuses so you have a, a place to speak from. You know, stop, stop funding and arming the okay. worst human rights offenders on earth as long as they're with you against China. You know, it, it, this is not the way to do it. So let me bring in Martin and then call on you. Uh, just so you know, David, Martin's been a huge proponent of the Rotary Peace Centers around the world. We have seven of them where we teach alternatives to military science. We teach about cooperation, collaboration, et cetera. So Martin, your question, please. Thank you, Bill. Um, uh, first, I wanna thank David for an extremely, extremely useful presentation. And uh, to me would rank uh, number one in the uh, club presentations we've had, uh, not just this year, but in a long, long time. Uh, uh, Bill mentioned my uh, support and interest in the Rotary Peace Center. So I want to ask you to shift to think about what Rotary and Rotarians have done, um, not just in the past, but um, through its role in creation of uh, 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 United Nations um, and the, the Peace Centers. But um, how is your, how are your materials and your ideas being used in the curriculum of the uh, peace centers? And if not, uh, how can uh, we as Rotarians um, make your um, arguments um, um, more uh, absorbed into the uh, um, lessons that are being taught ostensibly by our Rotary Peace Centers? Well, I don't know the, the full extent of the answer on that. And you and I should probably talk with Phil Giddings, who is our education director at, at World Beyond War. We're currently doing an online uh, educational and activist course over a period of months uh, together with Rotary, World Beyond War and Rotary uh, in 10 countries uh, around the world. Um, and uh, we have we have members and chapters of World Beyond War that are also members and, and participants in Rotary Clubs and some of whom have made videos and presentations that they've shared with all of our chapters specifically to go and share with their local Rotary Clubs. Uh, and we've, you know, we've just interacted with Rotary in more ways than I can recall or, or recount. Um, and, I, and I was very pleased last week uh, to have a Rotary member uh, forward to me the minutes of a meeting uh, that happened this past summer um, of the uh, Rotary Foundation uh, where they came up with a policy of, of divestment from weapons, uh, which I, I felt a little awkward being the one to publish, and I would love to see Rotary make a big stinking celebratory deal of that, or somebody within Rotary, you know. But um, but we we've been friends with uh, a number of of leaders within the, the Rotary uh, Peace uh, World since day one, um, and I've been a fan of Rotary since I was a Rotary Exchange student uh, many many years ago. Um, but I, I think we should talk a little bit uh, further uh, by email or phone or Zoom about, uh, uh, about what we can make available and do together. And, and uh, David, just so you know, Phil Johnson is uh, on this call. He's from Burundi. He's been active in talking to Phil about uh, getting the Gozi Rotary Club actively involved with World Beyond War. And he took your course and then he turned five other students onto that course. So we are, we are big fans and users, but let me go to Colin. Colin, please, you had a question. Yeah, thanks for 
Uh, great presentation and stimulating. Um, and and uh, as I skimmed your book uh, a little bit uh, yesterday, and, and a lot of this discussion seems to be focused on uh, the scale of, of country versus country, the, the militarization and, and, and uh, violence of, of country versus country. But what about on a smaller scale, the militarization and, and violence of, of police uh, departments uh, domestically and in other countries, uh, uh, and uh, as well as the militarization and, and violence of hate groups against uh, their hated groups. And, and is there, you know, does the large scale bring lessons that's applicable to the, to the local scale and, 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 and vice versa? Uh, yes, absolutely. And importantly so. Uh, and if you look at worldbeyondwar.org slash policing, you see some of our campaigns, uh, successful or ongoing, to demilitarize local police uh, and to stop the, the U.S. federal government and other national governments from militarizing police. Uh, and it's now, now, of course, in recent uh, months, uh, the, the, the key word is climate. All the local police departments in the U.S. have to say is climate, and they get truckloads of, of war weapons that they, God knows, they will not use for anything related to climate, but they get them. Uh, and it's, it's a problem. This is, you know, the, the, the consequences of what's been done these past 20 years uh, has been the heightened weaponizing of governments, but also of uh, uh, of everything within countries, not just international militaries, but local police. Uh, I mean, our streets and our airports and our banks and our skies uh, and our schools don't look like they used to. Uh, and I think the I, I think the vote yesterday in Minneapolis was was sad uh, and misguided to not uh, work on replacing the police department with something wiser and and more appropriate and humane. Um, I, I think you know we we have a cultural problem as was brought up earlier of people buying in to the need for violence um, and uh, you know it it's. It, 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 the, the, the interplay is, is endless, right? We have police departments being trained by the US military, being trained by the Israeli military, them training each other in exchanges uh, across borders. Um, we have you know, a huge number of military veterans in police departments, um, as well as you know, mass shooters in the United States being very disproportionately military veterans uh, having been trained in shooting at taxpayer expense. Um, it, it's, it's, it's important for various people's sensitivities to say at this point the obvious fact that statistically virtually every U.S. military veteran is not a mass shooter because there's a, it's a tiny, tiny number, right? But it's still a fact that they are, you know, that, that, that a mass shooter is over twice as likely, maybe three times to be a, a military veteran. And, and maybe we ought to stop putting so much into training people to be mass shooters uh, if we don't want mass shooters. Um, we certainly ought to work on demilitarizing police forces. So let me weigh in with a question that I, I think I've talked to you before about, David, that's I'm intrigued still with the history of Costa Rica in an area of the world where there were was lots of upheaval, uh, coups, uh, Cold War destabilization efforts by the U.S. in particular, Nicaragua, spent time Guatemala. Um, Costa Rica in 1948 made a decision to, to abolish its military and invest in education and health services. They've been prosperous and peaceful ever since. How the hell did they do that? Well, you, you probably know the answer more and better than I do. I think the, the film A Bold Peace and various books and reports tell the story pretty well. I know a little bit about it. I know it's not quite that simple that they actually have had wars, but what, the, what they abolished was a standing military right. so that when they were invaded, 
uh, they actually used a military uh, to counter that invasion and then got rid of it again, uh, which, which was the understanding of, of the US constitution uh, and various other national constitutions and laws, but has been obliterated by recent practice. Uh, and so if, if, if people wanted to maintain their beliefs in the utility of, of militaries, uh, but generate those militaries when needed, well, they would rarely, if ever, be needed, right? Because nobody else would, would have them. And, and of course, th this could be accomplished very gradually by stages uh, at whatever speed. I mean, if the US were to scale back rather than increasing, its military spending and its military deployment and threats and, and subs and ships and bases, you would see a reverse arms race. You would, you, we've seen this on rare occasions in the past. We see the opposite of it year after year after year. You have an arms race. You could have a reverse arms race. Uh, you know, if you, you, you could just pass a law in Washington, D.C. that said the U.S. military can be no more than four times the expense of the next most expensive military on the planet, uh, and and you know it would be it would be compelled. Other nations would have the power to to shrink the U.S. military. Um, uh, Costa Rica, I think, is an outstanding example, um, and I, and I think Iceland, despite you know being sort of a NATO nuclear umbrella country, you know is and all the smaller countries that have no militaries, and all the many many smallish countries that have virtually no military, um, I, I, I think tell an important lesson, and and they aren't all having the important dirty but necessary work of militarism being done for them by the noble guardian of the United States. Uh, the majority of nations on earth have voted to, uh, have, have ratified, a, have signed, and many of them now ratified a treaty to abolish nuclear weapons, right? So, you know, and, and uh, Norway has, has taken a step in that direction despite being a NATO nuclear umbrella country. Um, so, I mean, this is where the people of the world want to go. Um, and I think just telling people the example of Costa Rica, showing them that, that film, a bold piece, uh, can be very useful. So another question. And I think you and I have talked about this before. You raise serious issues about the cost of uh, the military defense budget, et cetera. Paul Kennedy, my understanding in the rise and fall of great powers goes further. And he says, the US is destined to implode financially because of military overstretch, that it cannot support its extensive uh, operations and eventually it will collapse. Do you buy into that? Is, is the economic reality coming home to roost soon? Well, I am extremely arrogant, but not arrogant enough to believe I know the future uh, with any sort of certainty. Uh, I've seen too many uh, comical disasters in terms of predictions of the future. Um, I, I did, as I said yesterday, read a new book called Spoils of War by Andrew Coburn, where he makes the case that the Soviet Union collapsed uh, in, in great part because of putting everything into military spending, and that it was largely its own initiative, not a response to Reagan's uh, military spending strategically determined to make them keep pace, but rather they were, they were seeing it as a jobs program, and uh, it was operating with the same sort of corruption and cronyism that you see here in the United States, despite being a supposedly communist country, you know, and uh, which I, 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 su I suppose that example, if true, and, and Coburn cites a U.S. military study that was coming to that same conclusion that was then, of course, killed, uh, uh, it, it, it suggests that, you know, a, a, a country where capitalism is a, is a faith and people actually believe the militarism is good for them, uh, you know, is that much more destined to, uh, to, to arrive at the same fate. Um, my concern with predicting the end of an empire 
uh, is similar to my concern with predicting the end of war uh, that, this, that, that I touched on at the very beginning of my presentation, the notion that war is going away, is that people will then sit back and say, okay, let it, I'm going to go watch TV. Uh, which is not how we're going to get rid of the wars or the militarism. It's going to take everything we can possibly put into it. Um, and it. And it's similar to my response to a question I used to get uh, about what was called peak oil. Uh, and the predictions of peak oil never predicted running out of oil before finding and using enough oil to destroy all life on earth. And so celebrating the expected running out of oil was never much worth celebrating to me if you were gonna first find enough oil to destroy all life on earth. Uh, and similarly, I don't think we have time uh, to you know, be be worrying about predicting the collapse of the U.S. empire, uh, especially if we aren't getting rid of the idea of empire, so that we're going to either end up with a Chinese empire or with five feuding empires, a, Euro a European empire and an Asian empire, and you know, splitting the world up into uh, competing empires. If we're going to survive, we're going to have to get rid of the idea of empire, um, and you know that that's that's going to have to be done while there's a U.S. empire such as it is, because it's going to have to be done soon, <laughs> and we're going to mm -hmm. have to uh, have to get rid of imperialism. So let me uh, ask you to talk a little bit about the courses you have, and maybe some folks on this uh, call would enjoy taking. I've, I've taken several where we're, you've recommended authors and we, we visit with the authors for once a week for a month, uh, David Vines, uh, The U.S. of War, et cetera. So can you just describe, uh, and Full Johns took one of your classes also, what, what's available on the website that, that we as a club could benefit from? We have a book discussion group and maybe we could tap into some of what you have already organized. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think you're touching on a couple of different things that we call a couple of different names in World Beyond War. One is book clubs. If you go to worldbeyondwar.org slash book clubs, uh, you'll see that we've lined up uh, an author of a good book on war or peace or some related topic uh, for every month for the coming several months and the past several months. And uh, you, you sign up and pay a fee and you get a signed copy of the book if you want it and you get on an email with the author and 17 other people, eight, there's 18 people can sign up. Uh, and then you meet four times uh, over four weeks and discuss parts of the book with the author and with the other participants. Uh, and we've, we've just started sending out surveys to try to get feedback from people, how they liked it, what they liked best. But the, 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 the responses we've gotten unsolicited have all been very positive. Um, then the other thing is online courses. The online courses we've created have tended to be about six weeks uh, and have, have in recent years have included some Zoom calls as sort of an extra feature, but in general have been an online course that you can go to on your own schedule when you want, when works for you. Uh, and there's text and video and audio and graphics and you learn the material and do the assignments and engage in the in the dis written text you know chat forum discussions uh, or, or you can post audio video whatever with with all the other participants and these we've we've asked professors and and scholars and activists to each facilitate a week so usually six different guest facilitators for a six week course um, and then you get a do a project at the end and get a certificate. Um, and, and then just this year, for the first time, we did a much longer, still doing it now, course in partnership with Rotary, that the first several weeks are online, and then the next several weeks are some local activist or educational project done in, in, locally in your country or your province or city. 
Um, and, and so this is something we're doing right now with Rotary in 10 countries, um, and we're going to do it again next year, but we don't know uh, exactly exactly when. Um, but we do, we, we have a number of book clubs already scheduled into the next year, and we have four online courses scheduled through the next year, including uh, War and the Environment, Leaving World War II Behind, uh, War Abolition 101 and War Abolition 201. Um, but then the, the one in collaboration with Rotary, uh, we don't know the timing of it yet, um, but, but we will be doing that again next year. Terrific resource. We've uh, heard wonderful things from Fuljans and the students in Burundi about taking Good. that taking that class, War and, and the Environment. So I, I've I have one other question for you, and that is, I still go back in terms of conflicts between nations to what the world, how the world responded to the apartheid horror in South Africa, not by invading, but by bringing economic pressure, by uh, segregating South Africans, bringing world pressure, but not with an invasion of a military force. Could that model have worked elsewhere? Could that model have worked, for instance, in World War II to isolate Hitler, cut off his funding, cut off support? Would that, might that have changed history? That's a very hard question for me to answer. You, you, can't, you obviously can't say a simple yes. There are too many things that are wildly different and the analogy doesn't, doesn't work. Um, I think it is, it is important uh, for us to learn some lessons as much as we can from what was done in South Africa, including what was done as and after uh, apartheid fell apart mm -hmm. uh, in terms of reconciliation and right. truth telling without vengeance and injustice. Uh, this is what we talked about earlier about needing peace, but also needing justice to maintain the peace. Um, and, and I think it's worth distinguishing the sort of economic pressure that's applied to an unjust government at the behest of its population as distinct from the sort of economic pressure applied to a few dozen populations around the globe by the US government uh, you know, against the will of those, of those people. Um, you know, these are different sorts of sanctions. Um, uh, in terms of, I mean, I've written a whole book that is much better than I can uh, recall or state uh, quickly on World War II and all the missteps leading up to it. I mean, there was no need uh, to get anywhere near the conflict of World War II. Um, and so depending on where you want to fly your time travel ship back to, uh, you, you get different answers for what should have been done in that moment. Um, uh, I, I, I think it's I think it's important for people in the United States to know that even top Nazis believed that without the support of US corporations providing materials and, uh, and their, their uh, factories, uh, the, the war never could have happened. Um, and I think it's important for us all to recognize how strong the Western support was, the British, the French, and, and the United States included, uh, for the rise of the Nazis as, as preferable to anything bordering on communism. Um, and I think it's important for us to know how incredibly successful nonviolent activism was uh, in Nazi held territories and Nazi Germany and even in the streets of Berlin, despite, you know, dramatically less knowledge and skill and planning in nonviolent activism at the time. Um, but, you know, what could have been, I, I mean, when, when you, when I talk to a classroom full of students about abolishing war, and then, you know, I ask them, was there any war that was justified? And of course, they'll, they'll say World War II, and I'll ask them why. What do they say? Well, they say Holocaust, right? They, they say killing Jews, you know, uh, you know, so, you know, which 
erases millions of people who were killed in the Holocaust who weren't Jews, but also erases a much larger number of people than all of them who were killed in the war, right? So the prevention was worse than the, the, than the disease. But if, if the question is, how could you avoid the Holocaust? not World War II, then my God, the answer is, is very easy. You just avoid the Holocaust. I mean, th there, were, there were meetings held publicly around the world for years leading up to and right through World War II, where the US and other world governments uh, explicitly decided they would not take the Jews or anyone else threatened by Nazi Germany. And Hitler declared, what what hypocrites, I'll put them all on luxury cruise ships and send them anywhere, but they won't take them because they know I'm right in his anti-Semitism, that he's right. You know, and, and, uh, and, and again, you had peace activists demanding that they be brought out. Uh, and you watched the British evacuate all those troops from Dunkirk. You knew what could be done, uh, but they didn't want to do it. They thought it would be an inconvenience uh, to allied nations to have all these Jewish refugees. Uh, and if you took them out of one country, they'd all want to come out of some other country too. And then where would you be? You know, so there was no interest. There was, you know, go find me a poster of Uncle Sam saying, I want you to save the Jews. You know, it, 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 most war propaganda is invented after the wars, right? And so it's important to distinguish post-war propaganda from pre or during war propaganda. Um, so if that's what people mean by avoid World War II, then my God, yes, easy, simple as pie, right? But avoiding the war entirely, um, you know, there, there's, not, there's not something that simple and easy, but you know, if, if, you, if you hadn't done a million wrong things, then yeah, you, you certainly, you could avoid any war. Yeah. David, I want to thank you. Our three hours is up. Oh, Kirk, Kip, jump in quickly for a quick question. I'm not sure it's quick. Uh, okay. David, thank you very much for your time. And I was the one who asked the question about uh, who defines just peace and how do you deal with irrational actors earlier. Um, I've seen some of your work online and uh, you know I can get on board behind you with the uh, commercialization, the economic, the cost, the the dual policies uh, that, that nations and, and uh, uh, seem to institute. So uh, my, my intent is not to trip you up on any of this stuff, but just try to understand a, a perspective on, on this, what I'm gonna say. So if, if peace were to break out right now, every, everybody around the world lays down any type of military weapons. Um, and uh, there, are, there are state and non-state actors out there um, that, uh, you know, state actors have signed on to, uh, uh, signed on to legislation that, you know, uh, that non-state actors have not signed on to. So whether you agree or disagree, but I think, uh, the, a realist perspective would be that we are, the U.S. is a world leader. So how long would, how long would, should, how long would the, it's, it's a, a little bit of a rhetorical question. How long would the U.S. being recognized as a world leader uh, sit on the sidelines um, for uh, so what we would, what our culture would say are noble causes uh, like women's rights, equity, genocide, not, no, no genocide, uh, something of that nature uh, before and, and, and allowing non-military methods to continue to propagate and hopefully come to resolution, a resolution being, do they align with our thinking on liberty, security, well-being, um, uh, which would be, uh, uh, you know, a, a sustainable peace, like you said. Uh, so, and then kind of wrapping it all up, <laughs> would we have to have a single ideology around the world to have sustained peace? Simple um, question, David, simple question. Uh, yeah, it, took me, think, it took me three hours to craft that, so my I apologies. Think, well, yeah, I think I could spend hours uh, misunderstanding it or answering it rightly or wrongly. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, uh, we would you could go into defining how detailed a, a, a worldview constitutes an ideology, um, but 
Uh, I mean, the, this more simple answer, uh, taking your questions in reverse order, starting with, do we have to have a single ideology, would be if we can't learn to disagree with people uh, without violence and without even uh, animosity, uh, and I think we're doing so right now and have on the through the course of this call. I mean, it's not that hard to disagree and, and dispute and debate civilly and amicably. If we can't learn to do that, uh, no, we're going to have a hard time maintaining peace. Uh, but uh, if we don't have weapons of war, uh, we're not going to have war. We're going to have minor, low-scale violence. Uh, you know, all of these regions of the world that we think of as inherently violent because of our prejudices or whatever, you know, almost none of them manufacture almost any weapons of war. Uh, and they might have just as much conflict and disagreement, but they wouldn't have anywhere near the death and destruction uh, without those weapons. And so if the world's governments were not generating those massive armaments and proliferating them, uh, would everybody love each other and hold hands and sing Kumbaya together in 18 tongues? And, you know, no, uh, but they also wouldn't uh, commit genocide, which is a, a, a close uh, cousin, not to say an incestuous relative, of, of of war. It's not some plague that arises out of backward people that has to be solved by war. Uh, you, you don't have genocide without war and weapons of war and militarism, uh, and, and you don't have war without what resembles genocide. As I discussed uh, at the beginning of this presentation, most of these wars that people in the United States think of as sort of even-handed, uh, you know, extra violent sports events where the number of Iraqis and Americans who die are about equivalent, or maybe it's 60, 40, you know, it's, it's, it's over 95, it's over 99%, uh, the local people. Uh, and to distinguish that from genocide, because it's the U.S. doing it, uh, you know, it's not that it's not that good a definition. Um, and so I, I don't know what it means to say that we that we, sh you know, to put women's rights together with genocide. Women's rights seems like a good thing and genocide, not a very good thing. But what seems to always be missing from women's rights when we talk about dropping bombs for women's rights is the right not to be bombed. Um, you know, we, we sort of leave out absolutely essential human rights uh, and, uh, and, and the fact that there are as many women uh, casualties of war as, as men, uh, the casualties mostly being of people who wanted nothing to do with the war. When we talk about sitting on the sidelines for nonviolence, one has to ask why, you know, why is violence doing something? and nonviolence doing nothing. Uh, why couldn't the United States invest in nonviolence? Why couldn't the United Nations learn that unarmed peacekeepers are more successful than armed peacekeepers and proceed accordingly? Um, you know, what? I, I, I don't know. There's so many catchphrases in your question that trip me up that I'm not sure how to answer it, to, to, to right. have, not to make that, sure that the time. world aligns with our thinking. I mean, I don't want to make sure the world aligns with our thinking. How the hell would I ever learn anything new if the whole world was aligned with my thinking? Um, it, it's like, it's like you know, scientists worried that somebody will prove Einstein wrong and physics will have been wrong. Well, if we arrived at the end of uh, of investigation and there was nothing left to learn, that would actually be a really horrible place. I don't want that. Uh, and to have the world align with my way of thinking or share my ideology, I mean, I, 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 I would like everyone to overcome violence and, and bigotry and prejudice and hatred. But beyond that, uh, I mean, I, 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 I like differences, you know? <laughs> So, thank, so, thank you for sharing those thoughts. Yeah. So without without that alignment, how the hell do you give an exam, David? Students, you have to ask students to give back what you told them is the truth. 
well, not giving anyone exams, I guess I don't, I don't know how, how to answer that question. Not being a, not being a professor or a teacher yeah. in a, in a, yeah. in a setting that uses exams uh, and being rather opposed to exams uh, myself and working hard to get them out of the Virginia school system. Um, I don't know, but, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm not suggesting the, you know, the, the relative uh, postmodern evil of no facts existing horror show. You know, it, it, the point is not that, 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 that every word and fact has to be up for debate. Right. Uh, but it's that we, ha- we, we, have to, we have to come to agreements uh, by persuasion and consensus gotcha. rather than by, by compulsion. Um, and, you know, I think we, we can do that. You know, yeah. we can, we've all agree. Everybody's muted. Who's not talking, right? It's because we, we, we agree to do certain things to make everything work better together and nobody's forcing yeah. us, you know. Stacy, you got your hand up. There must be a reason. I was just, I, I wanted to follow up on my question earlier. I didn't ask the question very well. My story of Hitler, um, you know, he had clearly at by 1935, 34, 35, had decided that he was going to invade other countries. He was going to build a strong military and he was going to invade other countries. Um, Saddam Hussein invaded um, Kuwait. Uh, how, do you, how do we counter that without military force? How do, you, how do you stop that? Hitler, you know, yes, you're right that Chamberlain thought that Hitler could be reasoned with. And then Hitler turned around and, and invaded Poland right after, <laughs> right after Chamberlain said that. So uh, how, do you, how do you counter that? And let's make this the last question. We need to let David go. Go ahead, David. Yeah, well, I don't, I, I don't know always who we and you are. Um, I, I don't know personally exactly how I counter it. Um, but, but in this conversation, we has been typically used to mean the U.S. government, uh, which is, has invaded hundreds of countries, not just... Poland and Kuwait, uh, and is, you know, the worst possible nominee for someone to counter invading other countries as the top invader of other countries. Uh, and, and I think when it was clear that Hitler was inclined toward war, uh, it was also clear to General Motors and Ford and IBM and the whole lineup of U.S. corporations that there was a great deal of money to be made out of that. Uh, and they assisted it and they didn't have to assist it. And the U.S. government didn't have to let them off the hook for doing so. Uh, and, and so I, I, I don't, you know, and, and when you take when you take a country that committed as many horrors as the other side in World War One. And you give it 100% of the blame and the punishment and you separate it into divided pieces that aren't connected territorially and you and you impose debt that's going to last centuries uh, and you and and you put in place, you know, a a, a horrible uh, sanctions campaign that's that's literally starving people uh, and then uh, you go and negotiate, but you don't negotiate here's what it would take for you to join the League of Nations. You don't negotiate. Here's what it would take for us to stop brutally punishing you. Here's what it would take to reunite your territories. You, ne- you, you negotiate, uh, you know, <laughs> very little, uh, mostly go ahead and, and invade someplace and we won't mind. It's not the best negotiating I've ever heard of, really. I, I mean, I'm not a, a, an expert negotiator, but I've, I've seen better. Um, uh, and anything, I think, no matter how poorly done, uh, that delays a war is very likely a good thing, uh, unless it makes the later war worse, because there just isn't anything worse than war that you could be trading war in for. Um, and, and so I... You know, the, the, the notion that the, the important thing in, in foreign relations in 2021, in a world with a completely different system of colonization and, and empire and law and war and, and treaty obligations uh, from the 1930s, is to avoid, uh, is, is to avoid appeasement 
uh, when there just isn't any Hitler out there coming to get you, you know, when, when, when it doesn't exist, uh, I, I think is the, is the wrong focus. Uh, I, I, I think exacerbating the problem when we have to be putting every darn resource into getting rid of the nukes and the destruction of the climate and the ecosystems if we're going to survive uh, is a better focus than you know, worrying about whether we're appeasing a couple people we've heard about who invaded other countries, living in, living under the government that's invaded more countries than anybody else. It, it just seems a little off to me. David, I want to call us off. You've been going almost three hours, man. We, we owe you a debt of gratitude. Great presentation. You've, been, you've inspired a lot of our young people in Burundi and provided resources to them. So um, let's keep it up. Let's stay connected. Let's get us, uh, our rotary peace efforts connected with what you're doing. So thank you very much for this. Sounds great. See you soon, I hope. Yeah, thanks.